Hello there, everybody, and a wonderful Friday afternoon. Welcome to another virtual space here on LinkedIn Live. Again, we're talking about a topic concerning virtual facilitation, virtual trainings. And you know, if you look back to the past weeks, we were talking with Andy Swan about trust and engagement in the virtual space, in virtual teams. Then I had with me Kevon Cheung from Toasty. We were talking about interaction and virtual meetings. And last week, Joshua Davis talking with me about um, meaningful connections in the virtual space. And through all our, throughout all these discussions, I came across so many names about really inspiring people. And I'm super happy that today, one of them is joining me. And first of all, again, very much, and thank you very much for joining this session. I see people connecting from Facebook, from LinkedIn, and from YouTube. And you know, we are very much looking forward to share with you, but also to get your comments. So the comments, so engage with us in the conversation and type in all your questions that you have, where you disagree, where you agree, or comments of your practices to interact and engage in the virtual state. My name is Barbara Covarrubias Venegas. I'm the founder of Virtual Space Hero. And I'm super, I'm really super happy that Cassie Labori is joining me, not only because she's a fantastic professional, also doing a lot of virtual facilitation and expert in the field. But funny enough, she has a blog, it's called Virtual Training Hero Tips. And so with this being said, I'm super happy to open the virtual doors to Cassie Labori joining us in the morning hours, right? Hello. Hi, thank you for having me today, Barbara. <laughs> Cassie, it's super great to have you here. Thank you very much. You are, for you, it's the morning hours, right? It is the morning hours in, uh, in upstate New York. Upstate New York, fantastic. Um, how are you doing today? I am doing very well, thank you. It's Friday and uh, I'm looking forward to the weekend and all the things that I have to catch up on uh, because I'm moving to a new home soon. So it's exciting times. Oh man, I can totally understand because finally after the pandemic, because the pandemic hit us in moving houses. So we were the whole pandemic here in Spain in between houses, imagine that. And so I can totally understand how great that is when, we find, when you finally move into the place that you wanna be in. Yeah. Cassie, um, I was reading through your blog, through your web pages. I was following you on LinkedIn since I um, I discovered your web pages and your services and all your expertise that is out there. Maybe do you want to give a little bit of a short intro. Um, how did you connect with the virtual space? <laughs> it was quite a while ago, and thank you for asking. It was um, about two decades at this point. I used to be a Microsoft trainer. I was traveling around the San Francisco Bay Area teaching people how to use Microsoft Excel and Word and PowerPoint and all of those things. And uh, one day I was driving to a client, I was driving down the, uh, the 101, Bay Area people will know about that. It's a very busy freeway with many lanes. And there was a giant sign featuring RuPaul and RuPaul was in a blue and green dress. And RuPaul said, we've got to start meeting like this on that big billboard. And it was an ad for WebEx. And so way back in the late 90s, there was an ad campaign that WebEx was running with RuPaul. And I said to myself, I want to work there. I had done one virtual training session with one of my clients when I was teaching that Microsoft product. And I thought, I know how to do that. I want to get a new job, uh, you know, in the Silicon Valley on this hot new software. And uh, I went and applied and got the job right away. Uh, they gave me a BOA, <laughs> which is great. And I became a product trainer for WebEx. And uh, that was the late 90s. And so I started teaching people how to use uh, WebEx from a you know from that software perspective and then what ended up happening is that clients would say to me okay we get where to click but how do we engage people and uh, that's when I went on to work for myself and then I joined Dale Carnegie and I built Dale Carnegie Digital I was part of the leadership team uh, that took that 100 year old plus company into the virtual world and uh, now I work for myself again helping companies all over the world uh, skill up 
their training and instructional design teams and even producers so they can do virtual classroom training in a way that is engaging and effective. Oh, fantastic. And um, what are the tools that you're mainly working with today? Or is it really a huge palette, like a huge, a vast um, amount of tools? Because we started with WebEx and Microsoft T tools. Oh, I got you. you mean, so you mean like virtual platform tools? Mm -hmm. um, in my current role as a consultant, I use any tool, whatever tool people are using to deliver their training. Um, but the most popular one by far today is Zoom, uh, followed mm -hmm. very closely by WebEx, and then I would say Adobe Connect. And uh, people are using Microsoft Teams. They're using it to collaborate, um, but they're using the Zooms and the WebExes to actually do the live meeting part of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you very much for commenting on that. And um, if we think about the topic today, so we're talking about interaction and engagement. And I think also um, I wanted to write an article to be a bit more critical about the term Zoom fatigue, because it's so unfair to call it Zoom fatigue, because we know that it's not Zoom as a tool that the fatigue is coming from, but it's rather the way that we are running meetings or the way, the way that we are running trainings virtually, right? I don't know what you think about that. So what is our main um, challenge when it comes to converting or transforming our trainings to the virtual space. There are so many challenges, but regarding that Zoom fatigue, I agree with you that it's not Zoom fatigue. Uh, I think it's fatigue from change. Uh, that we're, you know, anytime you do something new, you're more worn out from the process of learning how to do that well. Uh, than you will be when you fast forward and you're more experienced with it. Um, and then one of the big challenges, well, there's so many challenges with virtual, is uh, truly connecting with people and having people do the things they need to do. Um, these virtual meeting platforms are wonderful. They allow us to connect, but so many people default to just sitting and talking. And mm -hmm. in the case of Zoom, which came along and made us all comfortable on camera, sitting and talking and looking into a camera all day. And so it feels like it's fatigue because of that. Uh, but but I would say that the fatigue is coming around because of all the other things I just mentioned. So you were saying that it's difficult to connect. And that connect is also something that we talked about um, with Joshua last week. What would be your advice about an element that virtual training heroes should always have in their trainings, in their virtual trainings? Uh, I don't think it is difficult to connect. I think people choose to make it difficult by not paying attention to, to more than just a lecture and smile on camera. I personally think it's very easy to connect. And over the last 20 years, I feel very grateful that I've had the opportunity to connect with so many people all over the world. And so I think the main thing that people need to do to make it feel as it does for me is to connect with people, allow it to be about people rather than about smiling on camera and sharing your screen. You know, mm -hmm. ask questions and involve people. The, the virtual training heroes, they make the program, the, the presentation, the training, the meeting about their participants rather than making it about them. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing that um, that we discussed last week, and that was really a great quote that I never heard before, but apparently it's a very famous one, so shame on me. Um, but Joshua mentioned the one who is talking is the one who is learning. I, I love think that. that it, yeah, yeah, I never heard that before. But anyways, I think it's, it's really exactly the way we should also design it, particularly when we are online, because we know that we are losing people more easily. Yeah, we need to open with what are what, what are your opinions? What's your experience? Welcome. Just like we would do in person. You know, if you're conducting a, a training in person, you know, typically you arrive early and you get it ready and you open the doors early and you, as people come in, you greet them and ask them how they're doing, who they are and why they're here. And what do we do when we go online? Keep it muted. Don't open the doors until the minute that we start. And then don't allow anyone to talk. <laughs> what mm -hmm. happened there? That's actually more connected to a, a TV show or a movie, uh, which is you know engaging in a different way if we do it right. But but depending on the setting and if you're trying to have people be involved, then we need to let them be involved right from the first moment of contact. 
Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because you know Priya Parker she wrote a, a, a great newsletter exactly about the aspect of muting ourselves and the way we're using the unmute or mute button in the wrong way. So what is your take on that? How do you use or suggest to use the mute and unmute button? Um, I it is very much my policy and belief. <laughs> I teach people how to be in the virtual environment before we begin. And I tell them, listen, if we were in person, I wouldn't walk up to you with a piece of tape and tape your mouth. You control you. And so I teach people how to control themselves here. And I also set expectations for how they should be here and how they should uh, set up their own environment, um, how we will communicate together, and then what your audio needs to sound and act like while you're here so that you can be part of that. So if I'm in a big webinar with thousands of people, I'm going to mute everybody. You have to. Um, when I'm in a training and I'm teaching people and training is, uh, you know, skills based learning objectives where we're going to be working together and you're contributing to that learning process for yourself, then you need to be off mute. And then mm -hmm. have the power to or have the knowledge to mute yourself if someone comes up to your desk or if there's a dog, which we love, you know, mute yourself if you need to, but don't stay muted make your environment quiet enough so that we can hear you laugh and respond and not have to have that delay on, oh wait, I have a question, Cassie, you know, just like you would in person. And so I, I teach people how to mute themselves and also how to set up their environment so that they don't have to remain muted. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. really a super important point. I also wrote about that um, just like two or three weeks ago on LinkedIn. But I think that the, that the problem is the way we now, through the pandemic also, were thrown into the virtual world or virtual training somehow did not really bring out the best of us in the virtual world. So, for example, we got used to being muted. And I was in a conference and I found it super brave. It was a 100 people conference. They used very um, creatively mural and Zoom rooms, a world cafe setting. And they started with having everybody unmuted. They were like, we want to have everybody unmuted. And at the end, it didn't really work out because as we are used to being on mute, we were sort of, you heard people like talking to their whatever colleague, somebody was receiving a phone call, and it was a total, at some point, I wouldn't say chaos, but it didn't work pretty well. That's because of what people were choosing to do. So if we had all gone in person, would we be accepting phone calls in that room? We know to go outside and not do that. And so there's an element of people need to learn how to be in the virtual environment. They need mm -hmm. to learn the technology and the setup and what's the proper audio connection so they don't cause problems for others. And they also then need to learn about the behavior expectations. Yeah, you know, yeah. I would never take a phone call and speak out loud if I was at a conference in a keynote. I would never yeah. do that. You know, you know to mute your phone or turn it off, or you know to leave the room if you're going to take a call. Yeah, and people right. don't know that yet. It's like we're still learning that. And it's not the pandemic that created that. We've been doing that. It's been like that for 20 years. So what's happened is I'm happy that the pandemic is actually helping us to realize it because now people are paying attention to, whoa, that didn't work. And so what I'm I'm working to do is say, listen, it's not it's not the Zoom webinar that caused that problem. Back to it's not Zoom fatigue. It's our behavior and what we're choosing to do that's not making it work. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And also just to our viewers, and I see that there are people connecting from Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, on Cassie's blog, you find many virtual training hero tips. So mm -hmm. make sure to go there and tag into the blog. And I also see a few, um, a, a comment is coming in here from LinkedIn now. Hi, Michael Fulchus, he's connecting um, from Austria. He's saying, Wonderful approach using self responsibility of participants in unmuting or muting working environment in general. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. And to all of you out there, yeah, exactly. Let us know how you may be using the unmute mute function. What are your tips and tricks um, to make it work? Thanks and a lot, Michael. Michael. And to Michael's point, I just want to thank you for that comment, Michael, because I think that we need to, I, I am working at this point at a place of setting the bar high, uh, you know, high, like people will live up to what we encourage them to do. And if we're setting the bar low by muting you and not letting you interact, fine, that's how it's going to remain.
But like, I, I, I actually think it's really interesting that, that that group of people that did that Zoom webinar that you mentioned tried the unmute, because I would love that world where we could once again have an online event or ha once again feel like what an in-person event feels like when we go to a big keynote online. It's so yeah. odd to have the whole thing muted, but you know, it requires some responsibility on our side. And I think that we just need to be on this mission at this point. I know that I am on this mission right now to set the bar high and to have people do better. And I think it's just that people don't realize and they don't know, and we've been setting the bar too low for far too long. And that's partly why they don't know. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Michael, as well, for sharing. So, and to the others, just let us know what are your practices and also what are your questions for Cassie? We still have about half an hour and I'm going to start with the first um, question that really relates to interaction and engagement. So Cassie, you've been in the field for two decades, which is amazing. And um, what are your, the, your favorite tools or techniques maybe for a training to create interaction. You already said like, listen to the people, ask them questions, make them participate. What else would you recommend? I do, I use all the tools and all the strategies and the same things that I would do in person. And so I'm always coming at it from that perspective of, you know, what do you need from this? Um, I personally have a mantra and it, this is what I this is what I believe in and what I try to do every single time I train a class or deliver a class. I say, um, what did I just say that I could have let you say? Or what did I do that I could have let you do? And so I use all the features of the platform uh, as much as that 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 they have, you know, chat annotation. I personally love having people annotate on my slides. Um, feedback tools are very important. The raise hand and the green checks, they're such a simple tool, but they're a great way to connect with people quickly and easily. And so I use all of these tools to uh, encourage people to respond. And instead of me saying it or doing it first, I find a way to ask my participants to be involved. And then I respond to that and ask them to continue to respond using whatever tools we have. And so um, a specific example of that might be, I have a moment where I'm teaching people how to look great on webcam. And so I could pull up a slide and say, these are what you, the things you need to do to look great on webcam. What questions do you have? That's typical training. And frankly, it's typically what we do in person as well. So we can't really blame online. <laughs> but here's what I do instead. I go, we all want to look great on webcam. So guess what? I found some tips, some ideas, some things that we can do. Please take a moment to read the tips that are on my current screen. Green check when you're done reading, please. Or whatever, raise your hand when you're done reading. And then I mute myself and let them read. There's like five. And then when everybody has given an indicator that they've read them, then I say, all right, let's talk about them. Type your name on my screen next to the ones that you have a story about, a question, you'd like clarification, you disagree, whatever it would be. I'm gonna facilitate a conversation based on which ones they choose. And then they choose, we go through, we talk about it. I don't have to lecture anything. They have, they're adults, they have stories, ideas, insight and perspective that is relevant. And it's a way to make the class relevant um, for them and about them. And then we review and I learn all sorts of neat things and the tips are shared and we can move forward. It's wonderful. In fact, the only problem that I ever have in that situation is time. It takes longer. It's super fast for me to lecture it and then we're done and out of there with no questions. Uh, so I do have to plan for the proper amount of time uh, that's needed and I can't continue to think that my online training will always just be an hour. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's also the, the biggest challenge that many of us were facing because we uh, realized that we only can plan like for 70, 80% of content also that we might have been doing before because virtual led us also a little bit to more interaction because we were trying to, because we were seeing, we we're losing people more easily and yeah. trying to do better action and suddenly we ran out of time right in our um in our trainings so what would be your suggestion usually my number is like plan 80 percent when you're virtual also because things due to technology can take a bit longer would you have any suggestions in this I am, uh, I'm not a numbers person that way. Personally, I'm more of a creative and a more of an intuition person. And so, and then I, I'm going on, you know, 20 years of doing this. And so it comes through practice. Uh, so I'm not sure that I can give you an exact answer of how I do that, but I will tell you that 
for me, the approach is always, what is the objective and what do I need to let you do? And I know that it will take you longer to do it than I think it will. <laughs> and so I, I don't think in terms of 80-20, but I do know that I have to let most of it be about what you're doing and what you need to do and show me how to do. Uh, so f I think that's the best answer that I could give you on that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the way that I go about it. Because and, and you're right about the technology. People need a little more time with the technology, though it is my experience because when I do my virtual trainer uh, certificate programming, it is multi-session. And so in session one, they need a little more time then by the time we're at session three, they don't need as much time. They know what that's they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So that's it just depends point. on your group and also what you're having them do. So for me, it's always about the objective and uh, giving people the proper amount of time to think and process and respond, which is ultimately will help them, what will help them apply and use. Mm -hmm. If you look at your virtual sessions, for example, and if you try, well, I know you're not a numbers person, so probably this question is not really a, a fair one now. But if you compare the, the time that you are talking and participants are talking, interacting, how would you, um, how could you compare that or give it a weight somehow? If they're, so for me, they're interacting and talking. You, you know, I wrote a book called this, right? Yeah, that I is know. the title of my book. It's what I very much believe in. So I, I, I and, and to Michael's, we have another comment that's related to this. Michael's coming again. Thank you, Michael. You know, what do I do? For me, it depends on the objective. Like, so for example, if we go back to the webcam moment, I want people to be able to be on webcam and look professional and look great and feel good about it. And so instead of just reading what you should do, I'm going to let them talk about what it all means. So that's one example. Um, another example is like I do, you know, because I'm teaching trainers and presenters to, to train and present, I will have them practice doing that. And so we go into small groups to do that. Uh, I, I teach classes. So my classes are two hours in duration, generally speaking. And we are um, at groups of 16. And this is because of what I'm teaching. I'm doing train the trainer. So 16 people. And when it comes time to do their teach backs in the final session, uh, we split into two groups of eight. And it takes me two and a half hours to get through eight people doing 10 minute teach backs with feedback. Okay. And so that's the idea. Like I let them take their turns teaching. So if I'm going to tell you, oh, you're going to be a great trainer when you're done with my program, then I need to let you train. And so we set it up so they plan what they're going to be doing. I help them and coach them through that. And then when it's their turn, they take the screen and they share and they teach. They take the seat that I have held and mm -hmm. they, they, they go through that process of the setup. You know, back to your point, Barbara, that the tech takes a little time. You know, when you're the leader, it takes a little more time than when you're the attendee. So you have to share your screen and situate your slides and then get ready to go. And so there's that moment. And then they teach and then we stop and have them. Uh, get feedback and coaching from one another and so uh, it just depends oh, yeah. you know it depends on what my objective is what i'm going to have people do but it's usually i i have them do what i know they need to do when they're done with that event yeah 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 ivania is also promote, uh, providing us with a comment she's telling us open questions two minutes to win the test <laughs> That's fun. Give them a time frame, Ivanya. That's a great idea. There's something that creates energy around that. Oh, wait, I want to win. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So, and we have another question from a technical research focused aspect. Thank you a lot, Sveta. So, how do you measure engagement? What variables do you consider? And how do you teach um, TOT participants about feedback, feedback impact evaluation? So, I got it. How much time do you have, Sveta? <laughs> this is a big question. Uh, I, I'm always a big question. <laughs> great. From Slovenia. I got you. Uh, for me, it's about your reactions and your responses. I measure engagement based on, first off, how much am I getting? So if I ask for people to click the green check, how many people clicked their green checks? If I ask for people to send in the chat, 
a response. How many chats are coming through? So that's my first measure of engagement, how many? And then there's a second level, which is, and how good is it? <laughs> you know, how thoughtful is it? Are they confused? You know, good would be if they were confused, right? Yeah. In some cases. And so how thoughtful is what they are responding to then from there? So I guess you could say it's quantity and quality is my first yeah. place. Yeah. Cool. And do you also have something to answer about the feedback impact evaluation? I don't understand that part of the question. I need clarification. Sveta, so if you um, if you could clarify on that, we will pick that up later on. And maybe I want to just add something. I'm not sure. I, I think it was Jitsi, and that's really fun because I just discovered it very recently. In Jitsi, you have sort of a panel where you can measure how much people were talking. So you can also see the different types of people took um, to talk in, in the session that you are um, guiding. So you have like a very good overview. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, like I said, I'm not a numbers person and I'm not here to track how many times you spoke or chatted or raised your hand. It's not interesting to me. Uh, what's interesting to me is what you're doing that's related to the objective of the learning and how can I best help you reach that for you? And I think people arrive at that in different ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ivan is also uh, mentioning that all interactions based on adult learning principles like role plays, quiz by using QMU or Mentimeter. But the most important thing is our audience, of course, as you were mentioning the whole time. Fantastic. Whatever, Thank yeah. you. Matt. It's like whatever tools you're using, let people be involved. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever needs to happen. I mean, people just do not, for the most part, learn by you sitting and talking to them. Yeah, you yeah. need to have different ways to apply it to their lives and they need um, they need to make their own meaning. And so mm -hmm. it is our role as learning and development professional to help them make meaning in a way that's going to resonate with them. And that's that's a big challenging thing, which, you know, it's why all of us do what we do. Right. We love it. And we love that challenge, I think. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I also think that we see that this challenge challenges us as trainers because something that um, came out a little bit of the conversation with Joshua last week was that we believe a little bit that the swift or the switch now to the virtual space challenged us much more now to think about didactics and maybe also to plan more beforehand and that um, sort of made clear who has very good didactics in place and really a didactical concept because if you are in a room you might sort of overcome that a little bit with being a, a good presenter maybe but in the virtual space it is a bit more challenging yeah I, what what i have noticed for the two decades that i've been doing this is that people who learn to become virtual trainers and presenters they always give me the feedback you've just helped me be better in person I was not paying attention to my participants in a way that was needed, you know, for them. I was paying attention to me and working the space. Mm -hmm. And so we've been getting away with it for far too long. And what's happened when, uh, you know, when people go virtual and now that so many people have is that we don't have that space anymore. We don't have that room to work. We don't have that great outfit, those great shoes, you know, <laughs> that great lady. And so now we have to be focused on, wait, what's the substance? And what's the purpose for us yeah. to be here? And this technology enables us to connect, but we got to get back to the substance and making that relevant for people so it can resonate with them so they can go do it. I mean, the only way you get to get away with talking is if you're someone super famous and the world is obsessed with you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Otherwise, the, most, the rest of us normal people, it's not our story. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing that as well. Yeah, I also totally believe that. And I think what I've been seeing now in the past, also the past five months, we all did sort of a crazy learning curve. Those, particularly those of us who have never done virtual teachings before. And anyways, also those of us who have been teaching online or training online, there were so many tools popping up from nowhere that you were like flooded with that you had to learn like in a crazy speed um, in case you wanted to keep up with that to you know whether you want to use it or not and so I see a little bit the trend now um, that we try to use more technical stuff online to um, keep our audience to engage our audience sort of effects or different tools but um, not really focusing more on the didactics and on the interaction concept. But I think like it's, it's we want to use technique or technique like platforms or whatever 
to step over, I don't know, to, to not have, to have participants interact. I don't know what you think of that. I agree. I To me, I like the tools that are, I like options, but I also like simplicity in the delivery. I it's it's if if people have to log in to all sorts of things and click in all sorts of places, it's too hard. Let's keep it simple so that we can get the technology to be out of the way, and yeah. so not getting too overwhelmed with with too many you know bells and whistles, if you will. That's what we might say here: bells and whistles. Too many things that distract people from the point of why we're he why we are here. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, coming back to your objective, right? Yeah, like whenever I've been, um, you know, a lot of times I get invited in to give people feedback on their software and uh, on their virtual platform features. And I tell them, listen, it's got to be simple. It has got to be easy to use and easy interface and just simple and doesn't get in the way of why we are meeting. You know, we're here to hone our leadership skills, learn to communicate better, uh, use some uh, use some processes that have been implemented around the organization. That's the focus. If mm -hmm. it's difficult for me to log in and get connected and say hello, I can't learn that stuff beyond that. And so all these cool apps, I'm interested, but they've got to be simple and they have to not get in the way of why we're meeting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, the why we're meeting or creating meaningful um, virtual connections how would you? Uh, how do you do that? How do you create connection, or what activities would you suggest to use? Maybe you have like a few examples for us to share with. Yeah, sure. Uh, in my book too, I have over fifty. <laughs> and also, what I like to do, one of my favorite ones lately, I'm going to be updating my book actually because I wrote it in 2015, and I've got a second book coming out in January on the production side of virtual training and webinars and uh, interact and engage the book I just showed you, this one here, I am gonna do a second edition uh, coming up in the next year because we need to add more examples in there. So uh, one of my favorite examples recently for helping people make connections because ultimately the baseline is to encourage ways for people to be there with you and to share, ask questions, collaborate, you know, and you, you know, you've got to build activities around allowing people to be there so that you're not the only one presenting or the only one talking. So one of my favorite ones of late is uh, simply to pull up uh, a PowerPoint slide that has images on it. And then I ask people as an opener, uh, which image best describes you in your current situation or role? And uh, the images are very different. There's like gardens, there's space, um, there's very, they're all kind of different so that they can decide, you know, there's some animals, there's some flowers, things like that, you know, and they put their name, I have them type their name on the image that best describes them in their current role or situation. And then we go around and have people describe that. And they're using the tools to, um, to, to communicate. They're coming off of mute if they were muted, they're on camera, they're thinking, and then they're learning about others and making those connections to each other as well. So this is just one example of an opening one where I'm making it about the audience. And um, you know, for me as the person leading, I get to learn about them. I get to hear how they communicate and, and how they decide to be part of that session that day and the kind of meaning they're making for, for their own situations, so. Uh, absolutely. I think the example is beautiful because I also think that images that you're using or even objects that you're using that are around you, they can... Always <laughs> yeah. thinking, what are you putting up there? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? What is that? I know. I, that's a fun activity, isn't it? Have you ever done that one as an introduction where you, you pull an item, two items or one item out of your bag or your purse? And uh, then you have to introduce yourself and explain what that's all about. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I use it now. Go in your room or wherever you are and look for some object that uh, represents you or that you have some yeah. connection. With I know. Yeah. Like mine right here. Look, I have a glass of water and it's a tiki. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very, I love Hawaii. I love Hawaiian everything. And I drink a lot of water. <laughs> and so I drink my water out of my tiki glass. <laughs> 
And I think that's really beautiful because also with, with pictures, images, you can use it to make a learning transfer or to talk about learning transfer, what they, they connect with it. And they need to apply creativity, um, a lot of creative techniques um, to, to do that. And I think that's really um, very much, very, very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, I'm going to share, of course, and I just had it in the in the in the bottom here, your book um, that is on Amazon available. But I'm also going to link to it and um, later on in this conversation so that everybody gets a notification. Don't miss this book. Don't miss to buy it. <laughs> Thank you. Cassie, and what else would you like to share? Another um, interactive element. So we have the, the images, we have the objects that we could use for sure. intro icebreaker or for learning transfer. Yeah. Okay. I, this is my other uh, favorite. I have many favorite activities. I could talk about this all day, but the one that's coming to mind right now that I love to do. And by the way, I just want to reiterate Michael's question about, he said, suppose you had a training that would last three hours, what types of things would you do? And so I'm hoping that Michael, this whole conversation is giving you ideas uh, on that particular question. Uh, but this next one is what I like to call a treasure hunt or a scavenger hunt. And you could do this in a lot of different ways. Uh, so let's say that you are doing like new hire orientation training and you need, uh, you know, new hires need to go through the websites at their new companies with all their options, right? all their benefits and payroll and all the different things that are usually online. And it's a lot. And it's also something that could easily put people to sleep, even though it's important. <laughs> right? And so what I love to do is put together a series of questions and I can have everyone do the same questions. I could even use breakout groups and, you know, do like 40 questions and give each group, like do four groups with 10 questions each. And then what I do is I give them the questions, give them the link to the site, which they click on and then they go find the answers and come back and report back. Here's what I found. I love it when I do it in breakouts because then people are on there working together and they are having fun at the same time. They're energized and they're looking for the answers. And sometimes I run it as a tiny bit of a competition depending on the group, like who's gonna be back first and what kind of points might you win, you know, if the group is open to that. And, uh, and then the cool thing is, is that they get to present what they found and what they discovered. And the even cooler thing is that if they weren't in class, this is exactly what they need to do. Go to the website, search for it, find it themselves. <laughs> and so any kind of scavenger hunt, you can send them into software to work through steps on how to get something to work, how to you know uh, generate a certain report or locate information in software applications. You know, websites is an obvious one. Uh, you could have them do independent things and go around the office that they're currently located and find objects depending on if that was relevant. It depends upon your objective, how you go about doing it. But the point is you send people off to go find things and then they come back and they present what they found and that helps to make greater meaning in the program. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice because I imagine just for my context, also for the higher education, I think um, if you add there a little bit of gamification and um, some time pressure and the group work together, and you have like some fun questions also, within embedded in like the technical questions to say so, because I'm teaching mainly HR. So I could have them analyze something, a company's webpage about some sort of aspect of an HR policy, have some fun questions in between, and then see who comes back first, lovely. It's so fun. I've done this with compliance training, which people just historically say is so boring, you know, laws and rules and regulations. But I put, they were leaders, these people, and they have to lead people within these guidelines and these rules. And so how are they leading and how, what is their understanding of each of those? And so I gave them each a rule or a regulation and they went and did a bit of research on it and came up with some examples, found out what it was about, when it was created, why, and how it applies to uh, how they have led their teams. And they come back and they would share stories about it. And now all of a sudden compliance training was very interesting. Absolutely, super, uh, super fun, great. <laughs> um, nice, nice, very nice. And um, let me ask you one last question. So, for example, one of my last questions now when we talk about collaboration or interaction. So, what tools do you usually um, prefer to use or would you recommend to look into when it comes to group work and or some sort of group interactions and they are working on something? What do you currently prefer to use? Are you talking about when we're live online together or when they're not with me and they're working? 
Exactly, when you're live online together. Oh, and you, okay. for example, you break them up into rooms. Do you work with the whiteboards or do you work with Google Docs or do you have other tools that you that you'd recommend to Lucas? I like to keep things super simple. And so I like I like Zoom, WebEx, and Adobe Connect the best right now, probably in that order. Maybe <laughs> Zoom and then Adobe and then WebEx. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as long as they're working well, but I like the features that are within those tools. And then I just like to keep it simple and let people work on whatever, um, whatever we're teaching, you know, so if we happen to be learning Excel, then there should be Excel things happening in that program, right? Uh, I tend to not not want to use too many other things because it gets too confusing for people. Mm -hmm. um, but but when those tools are easy to use, and they're they apply to what we're doing, I like it. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want them to be overwhelmed by the use of the technology ever so that yeah, they can yeah. always focus on what they're trying to do. Um, yeah. So those are, I, I use the basics. I, I use whatever's connected to whatever the learning is. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't want to have a whole lot of extra from there because it's, it's overwhelming and we get away from our point. Absolutely. I also believe that we have to keep it very like simplistic. And um, even though I must say that I, I, I'm experimenting a lot with Miro or Mural, for example, for the trainings, because they have some features that are nice. But to be fair, my experience often is that participants are overwhelmed, particularly if you, and you need to take and plan more time to facilitate it. And I think that's, even though they have a very intuitive interface and elements, but still you need to um, plan more time to facilitate that. That's I know. definitely also my experience. It's like I could just share my screen and let you annotate my slide and we can move those yeah. annotations around. It's fine. <laughs> I save them mm -hmm. and bring up others. It works well, because if you are so, you know, lost on trying to figure out how to use that app, any app then, and not that it's hard to use, but it's just more, it's already so much to be learning something new. And so things just need to be simple. And so that's what I, I appreciate about Zoom and WebEx and Adobe Connect because all the tools I need are actually already in there. Mm -hmm. and, um, I can make them fancier if I want to, but I, I'm always looking at, does that fancy need to be there? Is, is that really gonna help what you need to do when we're done today? Uh, is that going to make that better for you or was it just hard for you to figure out how we made that happen and did mm -hmm. i just you know, so i think you have to be careful about that um i do also very much like in most of the programming that i'm doing if i'm not doing a presentation or an, an interview like this where it's a one-time situation uh, most of my programming is multi-session and so in between sessions i do love using uh, the collaborative tools like teams and slack I like having a place for discussion board, a place to post examples of work, uh, mm -hmm. to be posting questions and to continue the learning because in that moment, I'm always giving people assignments. You know, if we're gonna be, if I go back to looking great on webcam, their independent assignment is to go record themselves speaking into the camera, figure out how to share it, post it and give each other feedback. And so I like to have a place for them to do that easily. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so that, you know, we have this advantage of not having to be in class all day long right? We're not online all day long uh, in a meeting like this, unless you're, you know, torturing people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I like it. We can learn in little moments. And so it's not, you know, micro learning and, uh, and mobile learning and all the different performance support that we can do. They all just complement what we do in the virtual classroom. And it, it you know, all falls under the umbrella of being online or being connected in a digital way. And so why not use those kind of tools as uh, ways for people to uh, show their work and continue to learn? Absolutely. I also think that um, that is a little bit the beauty for me of the virtual space, because I personally, um, if I was in a one day training, I'm like totally bad in the evening usually, in the in-person training. And I do like it to be in the virtual space too. I also do two, max three hours. I have sometimes three hour session, but that's even though it's also very exhausting because virtual is exhausting, even though I do it a lot. I've been doing it also for quite some years, but it's still exhausting to me. But I do like it a lot because it has much more a didactical, small chance learning journey or learner's journey approach than a one-day training. 
Yeah, and if you're in there, you know, I think I can tell you after 20 years of doing it that three years or three hours online is not as exhausting today as it was in the beginning. So I'm more <laughs> used to it. <laughs> I'm more exhausted in person, honestly, because I'm out of practice there, you know. Uh, but the more that you have participants doing, the less exhausting it is for you. You know, but but training is exhausting. You know, presenting is exhausting. I mean, we care so much about participants, and we're, you know, not only are we talking about what we're talking about, but we're managing how they feel and how they're responding and what's coming next and what just happened. You know, there's a lot that we do. Uh, so That's true. Good. But yeah, I'm I'm with you 100. percent I'm I'm excited that people are are finally noticing this, and I know that it was because they had to. You know, we roll it back a few months ago, we all had to, and we were just in this mode of, I have to. And now I think we're beginning to move into, okay, wow, I was missing out. How do I be really great at this? How can I be, uh, you know, seen as a hero because I made this work for all of us in some way? Absolutely. Um, can I ask you one last question? And then I think we're going to wrap up because we are already at the end of today's virtual space here on LinkedIn Live. And the last question would be, what is your take on um, interaction in the virtual space and the need of a co-facilitator? So maybe not from your perspective, because if you have been doing, doing that for two decades, probably you don't need a co-facilitator. But in general, what would be your take or your your opinion on that, because what we experience now is that companies, organizations, they're struggling with, uh, or also trainers struggling with monetizing. Like, how do we, how do we charge for the virtual events, and whether an, a, a co-facilitator for interaction, check, uh, chat checking, setting up environments, whatever, is necessary. So, what do you think about that? I'd love to hear it. Thank you for asking. I just wrote my second book with ATD Press. The topic is producing virtual training meetings and webinars, and it's coming out in January of 2021. It's on the topic of the producer, the production tasks of a co-facilitator and how important that is. And so I very much believe in it and I always have a producer with me when I deliver my programs. A producer, a co-host, I, I use the word producer, I like that the best, but you could call it moderator, co-host, co-facilitator, yeah. you know, whatever it may be. I'm absolutely in favor of that. Um, for me, the producer is leading on logistics and technology and the trainer or the presenter is leading on content and most importantly, meaning, meaning of content. And so those are two different brain tasks, you know, and if mm -hmm. I'm meant to help you uh, communicate better if it's a communications course and I'm focused on the communication topics and all of a sudden I have to stop and be like, how do I set up these breakouts? Where do I click? It's a different set of brain skills. And I'm gonna, I, I lean on a producer to do that part for me so that I don't have to jump out of what we were speaking about. So I couldn't be a bigger proponent and wait for my book on where I outlined exactly what that role is and how you do it well. That's fantastic. I'm going to add that as well to the um, to the link of uh, as a link in the chat function later on. And with this, we see Brad is saying thank you very much for the great chat. Thanks a lot, Brad, for being with us, and thanks to all of you for joining the conversation. Thank you very much, Sveta, Ivania, Michael was there, Brad is there, and I've seen many more people who are just following without interacting um, um, actively. Thank you very much for being with us, Cassie. It was amazing. Really, really great. And yeah, Brad is also just confirming quickly that a great producer can really make a difference in having the participants feel included. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like today, I mean, you know, normally you present, but today in this role, you're the host and moderator. And <laughs> it's so much more interesting with you leading than me just talking up here. So thank you for <laughs> inviting me today. Thanks so much for you joining us and thanks for all of you out there for joining the conversation and as you know we're going to produce a blog post on the conversation and I'm going to add also Cassie's book to the blog and to this um, conversation thread in LinkedIn um, as well. Cassie, with that, I'm going to invite you backstage because there's sort of a virtual clock day, something going on. I'm joining you immediately if you have a few seconds for me. <laughs> thank you very much again for being with us and I see you in a minute backstage. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye thank everybody. You much, Cassie. Bye -bye. <laughs>
Uh, with this, I'm super thankful because it has been an amazing week. We really had so many engaging and creative discussions. I'm currently also working on an, an instruction for a virtual world cafe. So all the world cafes I've been running, I continue developing my virtual method and I'm going to publish that very soon on my blog. Besides that, I'm going to have amazing guests in the coming weeks as well. So as you know what was happening in the past weeks, the blog posts are already online and get and have a look at them. They're really with a lot of material, a lot of links to, um, to more material, more readings. And next week, I'm really happy to have with me Adriana and we're going to talk, Adriana Gildler, and we're going to talk about project management of virtual project teams. So a lot about also engagement, motivation of virtual teams and what tools to use in the virtual space. And with that, I say thank you very much for joining our conversation. Become a virtual training hero by reading Cassie's blog. And you have seen that and I'm going to also link it later and become a hero of the virtual space and continue the conversation. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much for being with us. Bye and see you next Friday. Bye bye.